This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, if you heard, we just read the, the Shema, is what that's called, S-H-E-M-A. We just read the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Now when we hear this in Matthew, there's just a few word differences, isn't there? And for some people, that just freaks them out. Well, doesn't Jesus know what the Shema says in Deuteronomy the sixth chapter? Well, of course he does. But what Jesus is quoting is, he's quoting the Septuagint version of what is written here. How much the Septuagint is? LXX. So see this tonight when you're, when you're looking at commentary. Seventy scholars, about 200 years before the birth of Jesus, got together in Alexandria, Egypt. And, they, and the Old Testament that we know it, uh, all the books of the Old Testament, the Law, the Prophets, the Psalms, all those, they were written in two ancient languages. One was Hebrew and one was Aramaic. Both of those languages were no longer the language of the day. The language of the day was the Greek language. Because when the Romans conquered the Greek Empire, they brought a lot of their culture into them. The entire world could speak the Koine Greek. So what they did was, these 70 Jewish scholars, they sat down and they interpreted the Old Testament, the Hebrew and the Aramaic, into the Greek language. So that every person who spoke Greek in the entire Roman Empire could read what? The word The Septuagint was the new international version of that day. Literally what? It was the most widely read uh, uh, Greek version. And if you would, the Hebrew and the Aramaic would be what we might consider the King James today. It was the old language that people don't quite uh, speak anymore. They, it's harder to understand. So all the Septuagint was, again, the NIV today, which version did Jesus quote? The version of the day. He used the Septuagint version. And that is why the wording between what we read in Deuteronomy, the 6th chapter, and Matthew, the 22nd chapter, aren't exactly the same. Because we're not using the same version as Jesus did. I hope that makes some sense. But it throws people off. But here's what we want to make clear. That we are to sell out to God. How much of our mind, soul, and, and being are we to hold back from God, folks? Here. Nothing. We're to give it all over to God. What did Jesus give in, to God on the cross? Everything. He withheld nothing because his dad asked him to go. Now, he also went there for the love of us. There's no doubt about that. But Jesus had a passionate love for his father. And that's why he went to the cross. We, you and I, we need to build our passion for God. Now let me tell you something. I don't think the cross was convenient for Jesus. I think he'd have rather been playing something else that day than hanging on the cross. Remember what he prayed in the garden the night before. Father, if there's any other way to do this, let this cup pass for me, is how he said it so elegantly. But not my will, yours be done. See, we have a lot of lame excuses for not following God exactly, don't we? <laughs> we really do. You know? and, and it starts when we're young. You know, we, 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 we want to appeal to things around us. And i got to tell you, the preacher still struggles sometimes with following God's letter of the law. There's just times when I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. There's just times I would rather act like the rest of the godless people around me. There's just times I would rather not love that person I know I'm supposed to love. There are times that my body says, oh, go have a good time, Ken. But my spirit inside says, no, that's not what God has called you to do. Remember, obedience is always tied to blessing in the Bible. If there's no obedience, there's no blessing. Folks, you and I must put God first. Individually and as a church, let's make God first. Because what did he also tell us? That he is a jealous God. And that means he don't want to share us with anything or anybody. Which brings us then to this. Our goal number two, goal number one, uh, put God first in your life. Goal number two, Love others as much as yourself. Now listen, the teaching of Jesus was pretty radical, but it shouldn't have been. Was Jesus using any words that were new here? 
They were the same words that Moses had given to Israel. They were the same Ten Commandments that God had laid out. The problem is, the teachings of God go against our human nature. Let's go back there to, to Matthew 22 once again. Picking up at verse 36 this time. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Verse 39. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And listen, folks, if putting God first in your life isn't hard enough, Jesus says you got to love others around you. Uh, Mike and Jennifer, they had some new neighbors move into them last night. And at 1.30 this morning, the new neighbors decided they were going to bring their ski poles. Well, you know, some of our driveways have got little dipsy doodles, and, and the speedboat was dragging every time they backed into the driveway. So 1.30 in the morning, Mike and Jennifer are trying to, to sleep when they hear, well, they missed. So they had to drag it back out the street again. And this went on and on and on for about 45 minutes. They never did get the boat where they wanted it, but they just finally gave up. Now, it's kind of hard to love that neighbor at this point. It'd be funny. They start loving on we start coming to church and joining Jesus and all that other stuff. It really good. But, but, but you know what? I don't feel like loving somebody that acts like that. I want to choke them. That's my human nature. My human nature is just go choke them. Jesus redefined who a neighbor was when he told the story in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Luke chapter 10. That, that's the, the story of the Good Samaritan. Don't have time to read it. Hopefully, if you don't know it, you'll read it later. But Jesus redefined who our neighbor is. Our neighbor is anybody who crosses our life path that we can show love and mercy to. I don't like that. I don't like that. I grew up in a family that just called right. Can't fix stupid. That was that, you know, I've never heard that, but that's, that's, that's the family I grew up in. Can't fix stupid. And you know, you just write people off, keep right on going, you know. And folks, note this too. Jesus didn't say, and this gets misinterpreted, Jesus didn't say love others more than yourself. And sometimes you'll hear people almost insinuate that. Well, you know, you've got to love people more than yourself. What did he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. He implies a balance in the statement. And I've got to tell you right now, people struggle with loving themselves in our culture. Yes. That we are so unrealistic. We see all these beautiful people in the in the fashion magazine that are airbrushed to perfection. I have a zit here and a zit there. I have gouges in my face where when my brother and I had boxing gloves on one time, I was beating the poop out of him, you know. And my brother just threw the gloves off and attacked me with his claws and took chunks out of my face that I could still point to. Because I was bigger than him. I had better reach, you know. We were in the same weight class. I've got other imperfections. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. And our media and our culture, they say if you're not perfect, then you need to... God made you the way you are. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. And then as you become more comfortable with who you are, guess what it makes it easier to do? Love your neighbor. But you can't love your neighbor unless you have a good sense of who self is. Now listen, each of us is so special, so valuable, that God asked His Son to die for us on the cross. That's how special you are. That's how special. When Jesus died, it was hard to imagine. It is my theory, okay, this is a Ken Hayes campism. I believe my name was on the lips of Jesus the day he died. He's a he's but he's not. He died for me personally. He didn't die for me impersonally. He died for you and he died for me personally. And then the problem is, we start putting the opinions of others before the opinion of our God. Before the opinion of Jesus. You know, when I was younger, somebody would do something... And I just had to one-up them. We talked about that a few weeks ago. You just have to one-up. Now, you know you're not supposed to do that, but what are you going to do? You know, if, I, if, if I'm going to be tough, somebody crosses me, I'm going to cross them back and dot their both their eyes, right? That is human nature. Girls and guys will go through the craziest things. 
in order to be accepted by their peers. Well, they, I mean, they, they dress in ways. Oh, my goodness. Why would anybody let their daughter walk out of the house with their butt chill? And the girls do it. Why? Oh, They want to be accepted. They want to accept a bunch of guys that that's where you got to look to be accepted by that guy. You really want that guy. I'm, I'm dead serious. But see, we put the opinions of others above that of Jesus. And, and one of the keys of this goal of learning to love and live the, is the golden rule. And that's, if you don't know where it's at, it's in Luke 6.31. Luke 6.31 says, do to others as you would have them do to you. If you want to be accepted by other people, what should you do? <coughs> Accept other people. That might be people that are different than you. That might be people that spill things. <laughs> we still love her though, don't we? Did she do it or did your mom do it? No, okay, well, it's okay, because I, I love Elena. She spills stuff at my house, and I still love her. <laughs> so, did you not have a little? I was just, it was just sorry, I shouldn't have done that, I, but she loved me. So, uh, people were getting up and moving around, now you know why. Okay.